In a recent poll by Barna, uh, Barna Christian Group, uh, half of those who identify themselves as, as Christians didn't believe Satan existed, and one-third were convinced and confident that Jesus sinned while he was here on earth. And in the modern church today, our biblical knowledge has never been lower, especially with the younger generation. And there is a rising biblical illiteracy among those who are professing to follow Jesus Christ. And while this is a reality, George Barna, he goes on to say, there's a growing number of people who are now serving as in-house theologians. And what does this all mean? Um, today, people like to define God for themselves. And many say things like this. Um, I don't believe in a God of love who judges anyone. You know, my God would never do that. Or I know some say God is like this, but I think God is like that. And what people are saying is that I don't want anyone to tell me what to think about God. I will decide for myself what God is like. And Christians, we are not immune to this because when it comes to God's character and the biblical truth, I know sometimes we say, I really don't like the sound of that, so I'm just going to skip over that verse. Or I, whether it is God's judgment, His sovereignty, maybe God's standard on sexual purity and holiness, we think of God in the way that we want to think of Him, but in doing so, in return, we make God in our own image. And TCPCEM, there is a great need for church today, and that is to know and worship the real Jesus. Amen? I know many of you, you've been Christian longer than I have, and your knowledge is greater than I, uh, maybe I have. But my challenge too is that God is more. Amen? Uh, Jesus is more. We are called to know Him through the Word. We are called to experience Him. There's never a point when you reach that point and you say, I finally know all of God. We ought to strive to know God more, and we ought to experience Him. And there is a need for proper and correct theology about God. And this is what C.S. Lewis, he gave this warning. He says, if you do not listen to correct theology, that will not mean that you do not, you do not have no idea about who God is, but it will mean that you have a lot of wrong ideas about God. And here we see the absolute necessity to know God. And here in our passage in Exodus 3, we see that God is reality. God is not some projection or imagination of who we think He ought to be, but God is the ultimate reality. God says to Moses, I am who I am. It is God who determines and announces who He is and what He is like. And so today we will look at Exodus 3 to see who is God. But what does God say He is like, especially in His relationship to His people? So I have two points for us today. The God of Exodus, we will see who is God. And secondly, we will see the man of Exodus, Moses, who is asking this very question in the presence of the Lord, Who am I? So first, who is God? The last time we saw Moses in the book of Exodus, it was in Exodus chapter 2 when he has killed an Egyptian slave master who was abusing a fellow Hebrew slave. At the time, Moses, he had this sense of justice and he thought what he was doing was right, so he has taken another man's life with his own hands. But the very next day, as he was talking to the fellow Hebrews, he learns that his crime has been uncovered but not only that, his fellow Israelites now have rejected him as a deliverer. So Moses, he leaves the palace of Egypt and flees for Midian uh, desert, for he knew that his life was endangered. And now between Exodus chapter 2 and our passage, Exodus chapter 3, 40 years have gone by. The first 40 years of Moses' life he spent in the palace of Egypt as the prince of Egypt. But now the second 40 years of his life, Moses lived a life of ordinary life as a shepherd attending sheep. And I don't know if you caught this in verse 1. As an 80-year-old man, Moses' life wasn't going all that great. 
Here, Moses is not even shepherding his own sheep, but verse 1 tells us he is tending someone else's sheep. He is tending his father-in-law's sheep. Nothing wrong with that, but it just shows at that time he didn't have any belongings or possessions of his own. And he was going about another regular day of work in the distant Median wilderness. And we see that here in verse 2, something very unusual happens. Verse 2, Moses saw a bush that was burning up, but not burnt up. Here you have to understand as a shepherd, Moses probably took this route every day. And he has seen what he's seen every day, day after day. But until now, he has never seen anything like it. This bush that is like a tumbleweed that was set on fire, but it kept on being burnt without being consumed. So Moses says in verse 3, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not being burnt. And as the moment Moses steps forward to draw near to the bush, the Lord sees Moses. The Lord calls out to Moses. And he reveals to Moses who he is and what he's like to us. And here are two things that we learn from God. First is that God is above us. And God is near us. Amen? God is above us, but God is also near us. First, God is above us and he is unlike us. As Moses is approaching this burning bush, God tells Moses to do two things. He says, first, do not come near. Second, I want you to take off your sandals for the ground that you are standing on is the holy ground. And you are approaching a holy God. And here Moses is saying, here God is saying to Moses, Moses, you have to understand that I am above you. I am not like you. I am God and you are not. I am your creator and you are my creation. I am pure and holy and you are not. Moses, you have to understand that before you were, I was. I am the God of your father, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And you need to recognize this before you approach me. And today, I know this is not true with this congregation, but with the younger generation. Because we want God to be so near and relevant to us, sometimes we dismiss the reverence of God, the greatness of God, God who is above us. I know that there was a shirt that was popular around Christian church. It says, Jesus is my homeboy. And he was just kind of wearing that shirt, just kind of saying, you know, Jesus is my friend. And of course, Jesus said that. You are my friend, and I am your friend in John 15. But you do have to understand that God is still far above us. In John, um, when we see uh, here in verse 6, how did Moses, he respond to the first encounter with the holy God? It was not cozy, warm, intimate moment with the Lord. But look here in verse 6 in your Bible. It says, Moses, he hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And Moses did what, what was proper for any creature to do in the presence of their creator, holy God. And that was to hide his face. All throughout the Bible, we see that this is the initial response when God's people encounter the holy presence of the Lord. We saw that when Isaiah, he saw the glorious vision of Jesus sitting on the throne of God. What did Isaiah say? He said, woe is me. And he fell to his knees. But not only that, Peter, when he encountered Jesus for the first time, Peter also fell to his knees saying, Jesus, go away from me because I am a sinful man. Apostle John, who has known Jesus, who, who, who has been the beloved disciple of Jesus, when he sees the King Jesus in the vision in Revelations chapter 1, Apostle John says he fell to the ground as if he was dead. Isaiah chapter 6, it tells us the seraphim who was known as the fiery angels that are surrounding the throne of God. They worship the Lord day and night and they are absolutely pure in their beings. Yet they're, as they're near the holy presence of the Lord, we see that their wings cover their eyes and their face as they worship God in their full glory. And here in our passage, God reminds us that God is above us and God is unlike us. And that is a good thing, church. We have to know this. There is a sovereign God who is perfectly 
holy, he is good, he is in control, and he is faithful to work out his glorious plan in the, all the affairs of the world. You and I, we cannot do that, but God can do it, and that is a good thing. But notice here, after establishing this proper distinction between creator God and his creation, God tells Moses he is near his people. He identifies with his people. And this is what the Lord says in verse 7. I have surely seen the affliction of my people. I know their cries. I heard their cries. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them. Here God shows his heart of care, his faithful mercy, the covenant love that pursues after pers people of God again and again. And verse 8, God says, I have come down to be with them, showing that he is never absent from our lives. God is near and present among his people, even though his people don't sense his presence sometimes. God is close enough to see, close enough to hear, and God is always with his people. And here in the first point, I want us to see that God is above us, but he is never distant. Amen? He is always near his people. God is unlike us, but he cares for us deeply. And he identifies with the needs of his people. And when people define God for themselves, usually they pick one or the other. People kind of say, there is God who is far and above, you know, far away. He is disengaged and disinterested in my life. You know, sometimes God, they kind of define God like that. Or... People, they define God as someone who is near and caring. But this God only exists to serve the needs of your life. And this God accepts and welcomes anything and everything do you do in your life. But the real God that we meet in Exodus 3 is that God is more terrifying and in His holiness. But God is most also more loving in His love than we can ever imagine or dream of. Did you know that? what God said in verse 15, he is going to bring the people of God to this very mountain. When Israelites finally arrive on this very mountain in the later chapters of Exodus, what they will see is not just this burning bush that Moses saw, but if you know your scripture, the entire mountain of Horeb was on fire with the holiness of God, blazing in full glory of God. And God shows, I am this Holy Lord, holy, 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 that is who God is. But here, church, we are reminded that God is also near us. God cares for you. Church, I know that we long for the nearness of God and we long for a place where we want to know that God is close to us and we know that we are close to God. But I want to challenge all of us this morning that we will truly appreciate the nearness of God if we first are awed by the aboveness of God, when we first recognize this amazing God of the universe, and you see him for who he is, but you recognize this God of power and love and holiness, he has his eyes set on you, and he cares for the every matters of your life. When you can keep that tension in your life, you know that God is above you and God is near you. And you will desire to get to know this God more and more. Our God, he desires to be known. So he reveals himself to Moses. But notice also here how God also shows to Moses who he is, who is Moses in the presence of the Lord. Verse 4, when Moses approached the burning bush, the Lord saw Moses. And the Lord called out to Moses from the bush saying, Moses! Moses. And whenever the name is repeated twice, this is God trying to get your attention. And we do this in our homes, right? Uh, you know, we want to call our children. We say, Isaiah, right? Doesn't listen to us. What do I do? Isaiah, Isaiah, come down. So whenever you see in the scripture saying, Martha, Martha, Peter, Peter, Tom, Tom. 
Whenever God is calling out to you with names being mentioned twice, he is trying to grab your attention. And notice here, it was the Lord who saw Moses first. It was the Lord who is calling out to Moses first. And here, as he is grabbing the attention of Moses, he is finally speaking his life-giving words to Moses in this encounter. And church, I want to ask you this morning, how has the Lord grabbed your attention so that he can speak to your life? Do you have any testimonies like this when you had a burning bush moment, when you were going about your day, but the God of the universe, he grabs hold of your attention so that he can speak into your life? Here, we know that there are times when you and I neglect and forget the necessity of God's word in our lives. But God is reminding us again and again, you shall not live by the bread alone. But you shall live by every word that comes from my mouth. And here, the Lord is creating a space where you can meet the Lord, give him your undivided attention. And God is speaking life-giving words to his people. And this is what we see in the dialogue that is taking place between Moses and the Lord. And here in this dialogue, Moses, he asks a very primary, fundamental question that we have all asked in our lives. And the question is, God, who am I? God, who am I? Sometimes we ask this question um, all through the various seasons of life. I know I have asked this question when I became a father God, who am I? When I became a pastor, and sometimes I feel like I'm failing in my ministry, I ask, God, who am I? Sometimes you may ask this question when you are of older age, Lord, who am I? And here in our passage, we see that the first words that the Moses speaks, uh, or first words that the Lord speaks to Moses is his name, saying, Moses, Moses, I have known you, And I know who you are. You are the one who was drawn out of the Nile's river. And back then I saw you, I heard your cry, and I rescued you. Moses, Moses, you are the one who grew up in the palace of Egypt. I was with you. I was blessing you. And I was raising you up. And Moses, you are the one who killed the Egyptian and ran away. I saw your sins with my own eyes, but I forgave you. And I also know the heart of justice that resides in you. Moses, Moses, I know that you are the one who's shepherding the sheep. That is not even your own for 40 years of your life, being forgotten in the Midian desert. When you felt like you took a big detour in your life, I was still with you. I was still using those moments to train you as a leader And I gave you a family, a wife, and children so that you will learn to lead my people with a father's heart and with a shepherd's heart. And here God is saying to Moses, Moses, I saw you, I heard you, I have known you through all the days of your life. And church, this is how God is calling after your name this morning. I picked on Tom, so let me pick on someone else, right? Mr. Dixon, Reggie, Reggie. Sonny, Kwanzani told me not to mention her name again, but I'm going to do it again. Sonny, Sonny. And sometimes we may think God is calling out your name to scold you, to express his disappointment. Why aren't you doing the things that I'm asking you to do? But this is not the way. Here in our passage, God is calling out your name to renew a personal relationship with you. To give you a new calling in your life. Here you have to understand Moses is 80 years old and he is receiving a new calling before God. Amen. I believe God can give you new calling in the places of your life in the age that you are at. We need to pause. Give our attention to the Lord and we need to listen from him. And we need to hear the Lord speak over you with his loving heart that cares for you. And here... God comes, as God comes to Moses, Moses comes back to God saying, are you sure you got the right guy? You're saying I, as an 80-year-old man, is going to deliver your people out of Egypt, out of Pharaoh's hands. And isn't it interesting how God's calling upon Moses' life came after 40 years of Midian wilderness when he was 80 years old. 
If God's calling came to Moses when he was this hot shot, when he was a 40-year-old man living in privilege, power, and success as the prince of Egypt, maybe the 40-year-old Moses would have something, said something like this. God, what took you so long? Don't you know that I'm the best man for this job? I got the credentials. I got the education. I got the power and connections. I will get this job done. When can we begin? And this is what Moses, the 40-year-old Moses would have said. But now after 40 years have gone by being humble, shepherding sheep in the desert, Moses here learns this important lesson that sometimes life is not about what you can do, but it is all about what God can do through your life. Amen? Here, the 80-year-old Moses says, wait a minute, God, are you sure you have the right guy? Who am I that I should go? Who am I that I should deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt? I don't know anything. I don't know anyone. Nobody even knows me. God, you sure you got the right man? And here as Moses feeling absolutely inadequate because of his past failures, his current weakness, and the scale of the task that is present before him. So he asked the question, who am I? And today, many people again ask this question, who am I? When we are enjoying, uh, when we are pursuing our own identity, normally you don't ask that question. When things are going well, you're finding success. But when we find ourselves unable to deliver and meet the pressures of life, you ask that question, who am I? But one thing that Moses does absolutely right is that he, in this process of discovering his, his self-identity, Moses, he doesn't simply ask, who am I to himself? But Moses asks in the presence of his maker, in the presence of his beloved Lord, he asks, Lord, who am I? This is so important, church. I know when my mom was going through menopause, um, she was the sweetest old lady. I loved her to death. And um, when she was going through menopause, she knew that something inside her body was changing. So she was um, acting differently. She was getting emotional. She was getting upset. So she was getting frustrated at herself, and she began to ask, who am I? But she told me later on in life, it is only when she went before the Lord and she asked in the presence of the Lord, God, who am I? And she was able to hear, you are still my daughter, I love you. She was able to move confidently in her life. And here, I believe the 80-year-old Moses, he was humbled. And he does not have any self-confidence at all. But notice what God does with Moses. It is not about giving, building up Moses' self-confidence, but God is going to build up God's God confidence in Moses. It's not about self-confidence, but it is about God-awareness and God-confidence that is being built up in Moses' life. As Moses asked the Lord, who am I? This is God's answer. God doesn't say, Moses, this is who you are. This is not what God says. God says, I will be with you. How does it help you to know who you are by knowing that someone else is with you? God is saying, I will be with you, and your identity is tied to my identity. And God is the one who will make the difference in your life. When you don't have that high self-esteem, we need greater sense of God's presence in our lives. And here God invites us, you can base your confidence, your self-identity based on what is taking place here in your life, how well you're performing, what you have in your life, or you can base your confidence in life based upon who you are in me and based on this relationship I have with you, knowing that I am there for you and knowing that I'm with you always. And yesterday, um, one of my oldest son, um, he is a pretty good soccer player. And um, right now, uh, we are going, going to put him in a, like a better league. But uh, in the YMCA, he is kicking butt. So I'm so proud as a dad because, you know, I was never amazing at sports. So I'm living my dream through my oldest son. He's scoring like five, six goals a game. And usually I put it on Instagram saying, ah, oh, I'm so proud of this man. And uh, yesterday was supposed to be the last game of the season. And, um, you know, seven-year-old, him and I were having a dad talk. And he said, hey, man, you know, let's make it good. 
And he's like, yeah, Appa, I'm going to make you proud. And so how many goals should I score? And I said, I don't know, maybe one or two. And he said, I'm going to score six goals tomorrow. Because I'm like, why? Because I think the highest I ever scored is five, and I'm going to beat that, and I'm going to score six goals. And guess what happened yesterday? I think God gave him a, a slice of humble pie where he struggled throughout the whole game. It wasn't because we're playing an amazing team. His teammates were scoring like goals left and right, and he scored zero goals. And uh, as I was talking to him, um, I think this is where I made a mistake. I could have been a better dad. He came to me with his head totally down. And I, he said, Appa, how did I do? Did I do a good job? And I told, this is where I, I, I'm a horrible dad. And I said, I need to repent. And I said, Isaiah, I don't know, that was a below average game. I think you had a very amazing season, but today you did not give your best. And he began to just cry. So I said, God, I need to do something. Give me wisdom. So the next game while my other two kids are playing, I placed him on my lap and I held him and I was talking to him. And rather than giving him sugar-coated answers saying, you did an amazing job, you did a great game, what I told him was this. And I said, Isaiah, some days you will do amazing, but some days you will do poorly. Some days you might have your dad saying, you're amazing, I'm proud of you. Some day you will hear the, your dad saying, you know, you didn't do a good job. But you have to understand your life should not fluctuate up and down based on how well you do or how somebody else says about your life, how well you are doing. But your life should be based on this fact that Jesus, he loves you and you are a child of God and nothing can change that. Whether you have a faithful day, whether you have a disobedient day before the presence of God, you are a beloved child of God and nothing will change the fact that God will love you any less or any more. God will love you with that perfect love. I don't know how much he got that day as I was preaching to him, but I, I just wanted to make sure that he may be a good, good student one day, he may be a poor student the next day, but all of life's ups and downs, it should not impact who you are as a person, but knowing that God is with you, that ought to be the fundamental identity of your life. And church, I want to ask you, who are you? I want to remind you this morning, you are a beloved son of God. You are a beloved daughter of God. When God says, I am with you, that ought to be the most weighty, truthful reality that captures our heart. Secondly, Moses asks, God, who are you? As Moses says to the Lord, when I go to the people of Israel and tell them God will deliver them out of Egypt, and they ask me, who is this God? What is his name? What should I say to them? And knowing, uh, verse 14, the Lord says, it says, I am who I am. Here God says, this is my name. I am who I am. And this is not a typical statement that makes much sense. At first, uh, it doesn't really explain much. You know, what does it mean that I am who I am? Usually when you and I, we say the words I am, what comes after is uh, something about your life. You know, I am a pastor. I am a father of three boys. I am a Korean American. But here when God says, I am who I am, he is some, saying something that is profound about his own identity. He is saying, I have no equal. I am incomparable. There is nothing in this world that can define me precisely. When I say I am, imagine this math equation. I am on the other side and there's an equal sign. What comes after only thing that can balance out this equation is God. So I say, I am equals to I am. I am who I am. There's not a time when I didn't exist. I am who I am. I simply am. And the same unchanging God who is yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And when God reveals his personal name to Moses, I am who I am. God is also saying to Moses and to us this morning, I am the God that you need in your life. I am the God what you need in this exact moment of your life. And in the Gospels, Jesus picks up this very idea by declaring seven I am statements. Jesus says, when you are going through life's darkness, I am the light. I am what you need. 
When you and I, we need to be fed and find satisfaction in this life, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am what you need. When we need guidance and direction in life, Jesus says to us, I am the good shepherd. Here in our passage, to the people who are suffering in bondage, Jesus says to the people, I am your freedom. I am your redemption. Jesus is what his people need at this moment. Jesus is the great I am, the great God who is glorious and far above us, but he is also the great God who is near us, and he attends and meets the need of his people. And I want to ask you this morning, do you know this great I am? But not simply knowing, but as we said in the opening verses call to worship, do you taste and know and experience that this great I am is good in your life? Yesterday um, in the soccer game, um, one of our boys coach, um, he said, that is a burning bush moment. And of course, I'm preaching on this passage, so I, it captured my attention. So what happened was one of the smallest kid who was playing as a goalie, what he decided to do was he held the ball and he decided to punt it. And I seen him play goalie. Normally, this ball usually goes about five feet front of him. But on this kick, what happened was kick, he kicked it so perfectly, probably never going to happen in his life ever again. The, goal went, the ball went straight down the middle into the air. It went past all the swarm of little kids' players, and it went into the other um, you know, team's goal, and he scored a goal as a goalie. And uh, the coach said, man, that is a burning bush moment. And he said, dad, and it's not my son, but he said, dad, you better go buy a lottery ticket for him. That's a burning bush moment. But I want to ask you this morning, what is a burning bush moment? What does it mean to stand on the holy ground? Is it a just freakish accident that happens only once in your lifetime? I want to remind you the theme of our passage this morning is that our great God, the great I am, he desires to reveal himself to you in the very ordinary and the mundane moments of your life. He desires to be known by you, and he desires to meet with you. Here in Exodus chapter 3, I want to remind us that Moses, he was probably going about his uh, regular, ordinary day. He probably got up at the usual time with the alarm clock ringing. He grabbed his favorite drink, morning coffee or tea, kissed his wife and children goodbye, and went out the door to head it for work. And this day was set to be an ordinary day. He probably walked the same route that he walked every day. He took the sheep to graze at the same field he went out to every day. But what separated this ordinary day from becoming extraordinary day? And what separates your day from being ordinary and becoming your extraordinary day is that on this day, Moses, he paid attention. He allowed God to speak to his heart, and Moses listened to the word of God. And not only did he listen, but he listened with faith and obedience. When God said, Moses, the ground that you are standing on at this moment is holy ground, so I want you to take off your sandals. And I want to remind you that Moses was not sitting in a beautiful sanctuary like this. He was merely standing on a dusty desert of Midian desert on a mountain horror and he took off his sandals in reverence and humility before God but I think the another implications of taking off your sandal is God I'm gonna stay here I have nowhere to go you are my priority you have my attention I'm going to meet with you and he takes off his sandals and he meets with the Lord, and through that became a genuine encounter, a life-changing encounter for his life. I want to remind you this morning, may we never be too preoccupied to slow down and look to the burning bush that God gives to your life to say, saying, God, God is saying to us, I want to meet with you. I want you to open up your heart to listen to my word. As you listen to a Sunday sermon morning, this can be your burning bush moment. As you open up your quiet time, your Bible devotion, that can be your more burning bush moment. 
as you are driving and you are listening to a praise song and you decide to not to tune it up but really listen to it and worship with your heart, that can be your burning bush moment. Church, may we never be too occupied to meet with the great I am for he desires to meet with you. The extraordinary God desires to meet with you in the very ordinary moments of life. Amen? So may we make space for him. May we open up our hearts to him and know that he is God who desires to be known, but he is God who desires also to know you and to walk with you. So let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. But let's commit to know more of Jesus. Whether you are in your mid-30s, whether you are approaching your 80s, Jesus is more. Jesus desires to be known by you, to be worshipped, to see the fire in you grow, this fire of God to grow in you in such a way it warms up your life, changes your life, but also the fire of God impacting the people in your life, your spouse, the next generation, so that they may be able to say, God, how great are you? How great you are. So let's commit to never dismiss these mundane, ordinary moments when we can meet with our Maker, meet with our Lord. I pray that you will have many more burning bush moments in your life before you see the Lord Jesus face to face. So that that burning bush moments will change your life permanently forever. But the blessings will be your spiritual legacy to your own family and to this church. So let's go to the Lord in prayer.